What's that mentality where you miss by a penny and you're being truthful to your investors and, and you get slammed and you're kind of fudge it a little bit and you, you beat by a penny like every quarter? What What's that all about? Yeah, it's called capitalism. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's, not, it's how the system works. Hooray for capitalism. Yeah, hooray for capitalism. When you're a public company, you have to think about the other end. I literally <laughs> used to get from time to time, somebody would send me a note and they'd put a little check in it for like $2 and 75 cents and they'd say dear mr keys i'm so sorry it's been bothering me for years but i stole a candy bar in your store <laughs> years ago <laughs> and, and it's been weighing on me ever since <laughs> here's the money with interest <laughs> you've started participating on tiktok but what is your favorite social media platform <laughs> Welcome to What The Tech, your gateway to business strategies and tech secrets shaping today's workplace. Hey Dave, do you remember getting movies, renting movies at a blockbuster, especially around the time when you wanted to see maybe a Batman flick or something like that? Uh, absolutely. I mean, renting videos, how nostalgic is that? It's certainly something that our children will never have the experience of doing. You know, we were, we, we have fun when we're preparing for some of these podcasts, this one, especially we take these little trips down memory lane, but I, I absolutely remember you'd go to the video store, you'd go to your local blockbuster, Batman was being released on videotape that night before DVDs, you go to the back wall. <laughs> The whole wall, you'd actually get tricked. You'd see the whole wall. It looked like there was plenty available. And then you'd find out that there was none there. And, and you know, I, I think at some point they went from just having a small section to the whole back wall. And we got the guy, the guy who could give us the whole story of what was, was going on. We're going to talk to Jim Keys. He is a former Blockbuster CEO, former 7-Eleven CEO. I got something that I want to share with him about 7-Eleven. You know, I love the Slurpee back in the day. I'm sure he maybe could tell us about what his favorite treat was at 7-Eleven. <laughs> you know, I, I spent a lot of time at 7-Eleven because during my early days as a professional, I worked for Philip Morris, which is now known as Altria, and they were one of our accounts. And so I spent a lot of time inside of 7-Eleven as a professional and as a consumer, you know, as a, as a, as a kid growing up, there were 7-Elevens everywhere. I want to ask him if it is the most successful convenience store chain in the world, because I know they're everywhere. I've been to around the world and I've seen 7-Eleven. So that's yeah. something that we de definitely want to dive into. So 7-Eleven, Blockbuster, he's got an interesting story with a book that he's written. I'm going to dive into the book because he's got some stuff in there, valuable lessons and valuable stories that I think our audience would use in their own lives today. Oh, super inspirational guy. You know what? If anyone's looking for some motivation on how to better themselves, I mean, this is it. I, I love this story. I, I think I, I had an opportunity to kind of look back at my own life a few times and kind of reflect on just some of the things that he has he's mentioned in some other interviews, you know, some traps that maybe I have fallen into myself. But again, I'm Super, super jazzed to have him on. Looking forward to the conversation. Yep, yep. And so, you know, let's do that. Ori, give me the intro. Let's do a proper bio read for our guest today. All right. James Keyes is a multifaceted global business leader, former CEO of Fortune 500 companies, including 7-Eleven and Blockbuster. Beyond his executive role, he extends his influence across diverse industries, including retail, technology, and energy, serving on multiple company boards that were public and advising startups. He is a committed philanthropist and dedicates his efforts to institutions such as the American Red Cross, Dallas Symphony Orchestra, and the UT Southwestern Medical School. He has had a very interesting journey, and I've been looking forward to talking to Jim today. He's got a book called Education is Freedom, and we're going to dive into it because there's so much there to unpack with inspirational stories. Let's welcome to the podcast, Jim keys all right jim thank Gentlemen, you for coming in today great to be with you uh where are you checking in from i am in dallas texas hey the big big d big, big d props to big d yeah and uh, it's a great place great place to live oh my uh formerly yeah. from massachusetts though i have to give credit to the hometown how yeah. long have you been down in Texas? Oh, gosh, I've been here uh, long enough, just long enough to lose my accent. <laughs> <laughs> long enough where they're not 
teasing you about your accent. Yeah, exactly. I used to sound right. like Dave. Yeah, now I'm. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, we want to thank you for coming in today. But before we dive into your book and before we do all the questions, there's some big props I want to give to a guest that came on last week, uh, Amina Moreau. You know, she had a very interesting story to tell around uh, using your residence for rental, for uh, work from home. And it turns out it's a growing industry. Think of Airbnb, but for businesses that want to use places to rent on a temporary basis. It was fascinating to learn what's going on in an industry and remote work. Go check that out. Let me give a big props to Amina. Thank you, Amina, for coming on the show. So now let's get back to Jim. Jim, for those folks that don't know you and don't understand your story or have never followed you or don't anything about you, tell us. Tell us about your background and what led you to where you are today. Well, that's a tough, tough uh, story <laughs> to recap in like 30 seconds. But uh, I, I grew wherever up, you want to start, wherever <laughs> you want to go with that. Well, literally, I grew up probably, uh, what, 15 minutes from where Dave grew up uh, in a yep. place called uh, Grafton, Massachusetts, small, small town. Um, once you get about, as Dave knows, once you get about 40 miles west of Boston, it gets real rural, real fast. And uh, not quite Appalachia, but it's, we, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's different. It's not as urban as people think when they think of the Northeast. And, um, you know, I grew up literally without running water. Uh, we had a, a small house that my dad built with my grandfather, and they never really got around to or could afford putting plumbing inside. So we had an outhouse and, you know, wood burning stove and the whole thing which as a kid I thought was really cool because it was, it was almost like camping, you know, when you're growing up. But um, turns out uh, I was, you know, I was pretty fortunate um, in spite of a pretty disrupted uh, childhood with, you know, my mom bailing out of that situation and father dying, you know, shortly thereafter. I, I ended up, I was one of those kids that probably shouldn't have gone to school, but it turned out that education was the, pathway for me it ended up being the huge opportunity that was a life changer and gave me gave me a chance to um literally dialing forward 20 30 years later run two fortune 500 companies and i, I know that um that story uh i'm familiar with the not having uh means i in your book you tell of a passage of of having government cheese I have a scar today, to this day, on my wrist. I cut myself cutting a big block of government cheese and the knife slipped and just gashed me on my wrist. And <laughs> so big yellow blocks. Of cheese. Yes, big they yellow blocks. And, yeah. uh, and so I, 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 when, I, when I saw that, I was like, oh my, he, he gets it. He understands. I, I relate to you uh, when I was reading about that and, and the government cheese, as well as, you know, one of the things that really struck me as, as you were writing this book is, is the very early part of your life. And, and one passage you were talking about at the age of 12, you were coming home from school and you saw a condemned sign on your home. Yeah. And I can't imagine at the age of 12, what, what kind of impact that may have had on you? Yeah, well, first of all, I, I didn't know the word. I didn't know what it, <laughs> literally what the word condemned meant. I had to look it up. And I, I was like, well, what, what does that mean? I know it couldn't, didn't look like it was good. It was a big red sign, town of Grafton on it. Mm. And, uh, and it turned out that, you know, my dad had been sick and the visiting nurse would come down from the town to help take care of him. Uh, and we didn't have running water in the house. And it, the house was kind of a, I mean, literally we had cardboard boxes um, as sheetrock uh, because wow. it was cheaper. So they were stapled up against the wall and, you know, again, my, my dad, I guess at one point was going to paint or put wallpaper up, but we you know, could literally see the Heinz 57 <laughs> on, the on, cardboard. on the wall. Yeah. So the visiting nurse uh, turned us in basically and said, these people are living uh, in, in impossible conditions. It's not good for his health. He is, uh, my dad was needing health, extra care. So they, they unfortunately condemned the house and, um, I, I was at that point forced to choose between going to live with my mother in the trailer park or I had a brother who had become a truck driver and over the road driver. And uh, he actually let me go and stay with his family for a little while until uh, 
until my my dad eventually passed and uh, ended up with my mom. And and you also talk about in your book that uh, when you passed, he was your fishing buddy and your best friend. Yeah, and that yeah. you had long talks. Uh, some that that you know you you couldn't fully grasp at the time, and you get to appreciate them later. What what was what was that like when you when you're looking back and writing this book, and you're t- you're recalling those memories of your early childhood with your father being so impressionable? What what was that like for you um, as you carried those conversations with you forward in your education and your professional career? Yeah, you know it's it's really interesting because I, I I talk about adversity a lot today, especially if I'm talking to young kids who are going through troubles that are even worse than what what I may have faced as a child. But you know, we face adversity and we think, oh, this is horrible. What? How could I be? Why me? Why am I going through all this stuff? But later on in life, I was able to look back and realize, you know, that period of time I had with my dad was something that most people don't have the privilege of doing because I had six years from the time I was, well, five or uh, six or seven years. My mom left when I was around five. She just basically, I'm out of here and she was gone. So I had from the time I was five years old until the time I was 12, exclusively with my dad. And Mm -hmm. that's a really unusual circumstance. So he would take me fishing. He would take me camping. You know, we got to do guy stuff that you know, most children living in a normal family don't get to do. Hmm. Yeah. And it was awesome. And he, and he, and he gave me some great lessons. So while he didn't understand that and he understood the challenges of working in a factory and not having enough money and, um, but he didn't know the path to having more freedom. What he used to tell me is it's not about money. He didn't care about money, but what he cared about was freedom. He wanted the freedom to do the things he wanted to do. He loved to travel and he wanted to travel the world, but he he was tied to his factory and his job to take care of me and to take care of himself, basically. Um, So that was his message to me. The one thing that they can't take away from you is your education. They take your money, take your stuff, they can't (laughs) take your knowledge. And as fatalistic as that sounds, but it, it, uh, it was great advice and it made me get very serious about learning this isn't scripted you know hearing hearing your answer to that that's exactly what my mother would say to me when i was growing up i I didn't get great grades growing up i was the youngest i was the youngest of four original before my parents split up and we have an adopted brother and we have some other family members through marriage but my mother would say about college specifically She's like, I'm going to help you get there. It's so important because just like you said, no one can take that away from you. And I've actually given my son that those exact same words. You know, you can earn that. People can take other things away from you. They can't take your education away from you. So to hear that we kind of grew up in the same area, our parents kind of had the same advice to give to you and to give to me. I find that interesting. Yeah, very true. Very true. And, they, you know, they, they, they really couldn't. Uh, as you know, living up and living in that area, you, you, you didn't have much of a world view. Um, we were pretty, uh, pretty much surrounded by other people that looked like us and sounded like us, and they didn't know what kind of advice to give. Hmm. But they did know, and you know, give them a lot of credit for understanding there is a big world out there, and you can go play in that world. Um, but you're gonna need to learn. You're gonna need to to study, and if you do. You don't, you won't be tethered to this small town. You know, you'll be able to roam the world and do whatever you want to do. You know, there's a passage from your book. I want to read it uh, because it's, it, it's, it touches on what you just said. It said, this is, I'm quoting from your book. I knew no one was going to take care of me if I didn't take care of myself. Despite those many, many challenges, I learned that adversity gave me strength. It made me tougher than my peers. And you, you, you kind of use that and that's woven through a narrative throughout your book about how that adversity, where, you know, a lot of people that find themselves today as well as in the past in those dire straits, you know, parents divorced, you know, dad losing a, losing a, uh, losing a parent, uh, not having means, 
where did you draw the strength at such an early age? You said from the age of five to 12, you were with your dad, but how did you manage to summon the courage during adversity to, you know, want to keep going? Because a lot of folks won't. They just throw in the towel. You know, I, I wish I had the magic answer, but I, I've learned that <clears throat> in observing others and how they deal with adversity, that there's only, only two ways to deal with it. You can either be the victim and allow that adversity to become an excuse. And we see it all around us. Uh, oh, what was me? They did this to me. They did that to me. They, it's their fault, you know. Um, and I, I could either use that as an excuse as some people do, or I could say, you know what, um, I, I'm not going to let that be my identity. I'm going to create my own identity and I'm going to move beyond this. And it, and it turned out, and I think the one thing that helped me is that every time I would run into an, an, a situation that was just horrible, I would pick my head up and I would work harder. And on the other side of it, there was always a sort of silver lining. And I would look back and go, you know what? I learned from that. And, and now I'm better for having had that experience. And that's a hard thing to do, but it's, it's worked for me my entire life. And those things that I struggled with as a child, I swear, helped me when I got into the business world. Things were collapsing. It was like, you know. It's not as bad as I used to have to deal with, and I'll get through this, too, you know? Talk, talk about that. It, it, uh, you know, obviously you, um, you steered 7-Eleven into, in, into greatness. Uh, you, also, you also tried to take, to right the ship at a, at a company that was actually facing some adversity with Blockbuster. In both cases, you, you faced adversity. Yeah. How, tell us how, you know, you kind of just went over it, but... What were some examples, like either at 7-Eleven or Blockbuster that you face? You're like, bam, this is keeping me up at night. I'm losing sleep over it. How, how are you dealing with some of those situations? Give us some examples. Yeah, well, uh, there's actually a lot of parallels between 7-Eleven and Blockbuster that people don't realize. In fact, we're in one of those periods right now. Um, shortly after joining 7-Eleven, the company did a leverage buyout. They took it private. But we were right smack in the middle of remember black Monday and you know, oh. all of the catastrophic collapse of the financial markets in the late eighties. And, and uh, I, I thought, Oh my gosh, a bad career move. My career is over. Seven Eleven's going to go away and helped the company work through those challenges of a, of a terrible financial situation and restructure yourself and come out the other side, a better entity, a better company. So when I got to Blockbuster, my timing could have been better. You know, <laughs> uh, you know there are times you go, seriously, you know, well, <laughs> do I have to deal with all this adversity? Um, right. you know? and, so and for those that are listening on audio, if you have the chance to go on, catch us on the YouTube side, we've got uh, a kind of a montage of what was going on at the time with the different uh, video companies, Hollywood Video, Movie Gallery, Blockbuster. Um, some commercials of the day uh, from back, back, back in their video stores. Uh, and I'm sure that, you know, when you, when you look back on that, you're just like, I'm looking at the footage here. I had a Blockbuster card myself and uh, Dave and I were going back and forth uh, prior to the podcast talking about something I'd never heard of before, uh, a managed frustration. I, was, I read that somewhere. Uh, in where you go into the store, there we go. You have the wall of the the best movies that were available. There's a movie gallery, uh, and you know you're, the the idea was that you know the customer would come in if they don't see the movie they like, they did get something else while they're there. Can you explain that. What does that mean? Yeah, well, it was it, it worked in the day when Blockbuster didn't have a lot of competition, but the new release wall was everything. You go in on Friday night, you wanted to see the latest, as yes. you said, Batman movie or whatever it was. But they've figured out early on, way, but way before I got there, they figured out that if they shorted the inventory and had too few copies of the new releases to satisfy everyone, that people would be disappointed, but they'd still rent something else. And then they'd come back the next night for what they really wanted to see. 
Well, then mm-hmm. enter Netflix and Redbox. That you know, whole idea of disappointing the customer on purpose didn't work so well. <laughs> you know, once you have competition, right? Yeah, it, it changes yeah. the equation. It does. It changes the equation. And the other thing, as I was mentioning, I ran into that crisis in you know at at Seven Eleven when the financial markets collapsed. We made it through. We made it through a stronger company. In many ways, it was the best thing that could have happened to the company because it forced us to reinvent ourselves. Well, unfortunately, I got to Blockbuster in 2007. And I'm, I'm famous for a quote saying, you know, Netflix and, you know, isn't really the competition. And everyone truncated the rest of the sentence because what I finished the sentence with is Apple and, and Amazon are because clearly the future of streaming was evident at the time and it was coming. What no one predicted, though, was the collapse of the financial market in 2008, which was exactly the same thing I went through at 7-Eleven. So here we were, poised for success, transform the company, take it to streaming, and the financial markets just collapsed all around us. Right. And and I think you and I had a little discussion prior and that Lehman went under, um, Washington Mutual went under. Um, capital dried up everywhere overnight. Right. Uh, right. The markets weren't liquid. Uh, there's there's several documentaries on on that event happening here, and a bunch of other companies struggled as a result of that. You know, Borders went under. Uh, they had a lot of debt, almost a billion in debt as well. Uh, you had Chrysler also struggling, um, and they had a lot of debt also on the books. That made things worse for them. And so companies like Blockbusters and the ones I mentioned found it very difficult to operate in that environment. And I wanted to ask you about the, this, this specific aspect of when credit dries up, because there's a lot of entrepreneurs that listen to us. Yes. What's the learning lesson of, of that moment? Because yeah. it seems like from what you're saying, this, hap- this movie happened before. If I were to take that from your Blockbuster, <laughs> we've seen yeah. this movie before. We're kind of in that movie today. What's your advice to entrepreneurs when we get into this situation? Cash flow, cash flow, cash flow. I mean, it is your oxygen. It's what's needed to live. Now, think about 7-Eleven. They picked up $4 billion of debt at 16%. You can Oof. imagine what the interest payments were on that debt. Oh. So they were, <laughs> yeah, they were insufficient to be able to handle the cash, the, the cash needs to pay back the debt. And so by, by uh, 1991, 7-Eleven had filed for bankruptcy. Now we made it through, we were able to, you know, bring in a strategic partner. We were able to reinvent the company. Is this the franchisees in Japan oh, that came in and, yeah, yeah. and, and stepped in? Okay. Yes, that was fabulous. They came in, they, they brought cash, they brought better than cash. They brought uh, an awareness of technology and shared the technology that made 7-Eleven Japan so wildly successful. Hmm. And we were able to borrow that technology and use it to use data to make decisions for the first time ever. I love that. Big, big deal. So I went into Blockbuster armed with that knowledge of how to restructure a company, understanding of the needs for cash flow, and prepared to do the same thing to bring technology to Blockbuster. What most people missed is that when Blockbuster had a billion dollars of debt, and the week I arrived literally had already busted a bank company, which mm-hmm. meant they were already threatened with default, threatening default. On the week you debt. arrived? When I, the week I arrived, literally. Most people don't know this story. None of that was public information at the time. It was between the banks and, and, the, and, and the company. And the board, of course, um, and with the banks being under stress, I'm sure they were very they were they had no appetite for that, right? Because well, they, they're being they pulled by their investors as well. Right, exactly. Now they weren't quite under as much stress yet. This is still in 2007, and you know, if I had a crystal ball, I would have restructured that debt immediately in 2007. We would have sailed through the re- through the financial crisis without a problem because. Blockbuster was actually a cash flow machine. Hmm. It it made 
uh, we literally doubled our EBITDA, more or less a surrogate for cash flow in the year 2008 by doing things like having more inventory of new releases, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it was relatively low hanging fruit to be able to improve the operations and pull more cash from the company to be able to satisfy our debt. But the one thing we couldn't control is it wasn't just the collapse of the financial markets. It was the, it was the rate at which things fell apart. So we had this billion dollars of debt. We had a third of it due in 2009. And because the timing was so aggressive. When Lehman's collapsed in September of 2008, by the time we got to 2009, it was not impossible to refinance the debt. We were able to do it, but you can imagine now going from five or six percent interest to twelve. The payments right? on that, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And that then caused fear among the studios, and that fear really is what caused them to reduce their credit terms from 90 days to cash payment. So before we could rent a video, we had to pay for it in cash. Wow. But you, in, yeah. And that's, it's interesting when you say that because a lot of, um, if, we, if we take that down to the small business level, many yeah. small businesses face exactly that situation where uh, it's hard to get lending, it's hard to get credit lines, it's hard to, that are, that are favorable, right? Um, exactly. The banks love, and I could, from our own experience in our own company, you know, they, they want to know how many assets do you own? You own do you own uh, real estate holdings? Because if something goes south, they want to go ahead and take that from you. And if there was one thing, you know, I, I, if I had a magic wand, especially for the small business sector, that there were the availability of credit, even in, under good times, it's, it's definitely hard. They want you to write a, you know, an encyclopedia of your assets and what's happening in the, in the company, just to loan you a hundred thousand dollars, $200,000. We don't even talk about them, <laughs> the amounts that, that, that are loaned over to the big, large corporations, but it, it's crazy. Why, why can't you, you're a businessman. Why can't we fix that system for the small business uh, operator out there? Well, you, you, you can, and the, and the small, and this is the lesson. It's a, such an important lesson for the small business operator because there are many forms of debt. We forget that, I mean, they think, well, my debt is only that debt that I borrow from the bank or, you know, uh, or somebody loaned me this money and I have interest payments on it. There are other forms of debt. And that's why I say cash flow, cash flow, cash flow, because our credit terms from our suppliers is also another form of debt, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. what happened to Blockbuster, and this is a great lesson, we had a billion dollars of debt. Yes, we had to refinance it. Yes, we had increased interest costs, but we were still fine. We had plenty of cash flow to satisfy the payments. The banks wouldn't have lent us money at 12% if we weren't able to demonstrate the ability to, to repay that debt and repay those interest loans, right? Those interest, the interest on that, on that cash. What surprised us and we shouldn't have been surprised. In hindsight, we should have prepared for this. But when the studios, our suppliers, said, we're going to take you from 90-day credit terms to cash, that single act pulled $300 million of cash flow out of the business. Now, we went from being able to satisfy those interest payments to now, all of a sudden, we can't. So again, Careful, careful management of cash in times like these are critical because it may surprise you that when you think you have the cash to satisfy that debt obligation, there may be other forms of debt that you're not counting on, like your credit terms, that will ultimately uh, could force you into a restructure. All right. I heard, I heard somebody say, uh, this is a former Amazon employee we interviewed. Uh, Nick Gazar, Nick Gazar, wherever I think believe he's in Germany. Wherever you are in Germany, big props to you. He said something: you have to be profits obsessed. And and, and we were talking a little bit about this this conversation. And it, if you're not profits obsessed, whether you're a small business operator all the way up to you know big companies like like Seven Eleven and and Blockbuster, you can run into some problems, especially when things get tight. And yeah. it really reframed my 
my thinking as an entrepreneur is that above all, you have to have profits. Otherwise, the whole thing will, like you said, it'll just collapse. Oh, yeah. No, exactly. Well, you know, the, the, the great lesson here, you look at all the armchair quarterbacks who assess Blockbuster and they go, oh, what a bunch of idiots. They didn't keep up with technology. Why didn't they advertise? And then when they find out that we had Blockbuster on demand, which mm -hmm. was a, a superior service in a sense that. Yeah, where's my Blockbuster app? I would, I, I, I've yeah. got a phone, you know, I'm, the world would be, if, I'm sure, in, in another universe and if different set of events. I'd have a Blockbuster app on my phone today. Oh, yeah, no, exactly, exactly, and you would. And, and when, we, when we bought Movie Link, renamed it Blockbuster On Demand, it was before apps. I mean, literally, Apple introduced apps on the iPhone in 2007. And so that mm. no one was really doing apps yet. So we were really early in our adoption of this technology and our attempt to roll it out. But all of a sudden, then, when the financial markets collapse, as I said, got to manage cash. So the banks are saying, hey, we'll shut you down if you don't satisfy this debt. We had to, we had to funnel money from what had been advertising aggressively against Netflix for subscribers and spending the money to develop our own apps and spending the money to get into devices like Roku and others. We had to, re for a period of time, re direct some of that cash into satisfying our debt obligations. Now, that was to save the company, keep it alive. And ultimately, time just ran out. We weren't able to do that. Um, but it, as I said, it's easy to second guess and look back. But what we were fighting was a, a fight for survival, as opposed to Netflix, who had no debt. Brand new company, had investors throwing equity money at them. And we had to, unfortunately, to satisfy that legacy debt obligation. And I, I had heard somewhere that in the early days of Netflix, their strategy was, it wasn't about making money. Their strategy was going low. I think it was a dollar or $2 a month, get the, the videos via mail. And they were taking a loss year after year. My my stepfather had purchased bad timing, um, probably about 07, 06, 07. He had purchased a, a small mom and pop video store slash ice cream store. And he would, t he, you know, and Netflix was a new thing. And he was telling me about it. He's like, they're not making money right now. Their goal is to put us out of business. Their goal is to make it so convenient where you don't have to go to the video store Friday, five o'clock to go get think movies for your family to watch and he's like they're losing money i'm like i just that doesn't really make sense to me he's like it'll make sense to you in 20 years yeah <laughs> and we're in 20 years sure enough 20 years later he yeah he was right they they're making plenty of money now shoot now netflix wants to charge me more money for no commercials <laughs> that's that's like right on the horizon i mentioned that to someone the other day and they said is that a true thing i'm like do you have hulu and they said yeah i'm like do you have commercials on hulu no, because I pay for the extra premium, you know, offering from Hulu, so I don't have commercials. Yeah, like Netflix is trying to trying to do that right now. You know what the example is? If you compare Walmart, or if you really want a drastic comparison, Sears, mm -hmm. right, to Amazon. You know, the, the the again that armchair quarterback sitting around, you know, and he's you know typing in uh, responses to it. To, to somebody on TikTok and he's saying, yeah, those idiots, they should do it a different way, right? But Amazon for years were able to build their full infrastructure and do home delivery without having to make money. They didn't, it took many years before they posted profit number one, dollar number one, right? Walmart, in contrast, it's a public company. And if they miss their earnings by a penny, their stock will get slammed. And Can if I ask they you about that, Jim, oh, yeah. we talked to um, we talked to James Orsini. He's the uh, president of the Sasha Group over at Vayner Media for Gary oh. Vaynerchuk, and we touched on this topic. And you were also in a public company. He also ran a public company. What's what's that mentality where you miss by a penny and you're being truthful to your investors and stakeholders and everybody else, and you get slammed? 
and you're kind of fudge it a little bit and you you beat by a penny like every quarter what what's what's that all about is that that, that, that happens today yeah it's called capitalism i mean it's, <laughs> it's, how, it's how the system works hooray for capitalism yeah hooray for capitalism no it's how the system works when you're a public company i mean you go you have to think about the other end okay i'm an investor I'm going to put my money instead of over here. I'm going to put it here and I'm going to trust you to have improved results and earn me, you know, um, and, 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 an appreciation on my equity or a big dividend or something like that. Yeah. And, and so my time frame is different. It's a different investment from if I say, you know what, instead of putting that, thousand dollars into this public company in the stock market i'm going to go invest it in this startup over there but when i do that i can't take it back out right so if netflix was a startup and i put a thousand dollars in netflix that money is gone i mean i may never see that because they may not make it their startup hmm. and i so there's a hundred percent risk on that money now it may pay great dividends if they are a company like Amazon or Netflix, then they are wildly successful, but it may take five years, 10 years, 20 years. If I put the money in the stock market, I expect that if I don't like what they're doing, I'm gonna take it back out. There is no time frame on that investment. So public companies are then held to a much higher standard in their ability to generate returns quickly because they're not thought of as that risky investment that may take years to generate a return. That's it. So it's, it's fundamental the way the capitalist system works and the way our financial system works. And it actually makes sense. So ironically, you take that same model. When I approached Blockbuster, I didn't anticipate going in as a public company CEO. I knew they had a big transformation. I knew that that transformation would be easier to accomplish as a private company. So my plan was to get private equity to support the takeover of Blockbuster, rebuild it, create that digital en entity, and then several years later, relaunch it as a public company once the heavy lifting was done. That you wouldn't have the pressures of the, of the stock market and investors, you know, wanting their, their cash back, essentially, you know, a couple of exactly. quarters later. Exactly. Gotcha. And, and, and so that was the original plan. And, you know, I was talked into it. Carl Icahn convinced me. He was one of the directors. He's like, Keys, you're an operator. I'm a financial guy. You listen to me. Just shut up and join the company. <laughs> I, I'm sure it was a lot more colorful than you're explaining it right now. Because he doesn't seem <laughs> yeah, like a guy that, you know, talks just very plain and... Without holding the f bombs and whatnot, yeah, I learned I learned some new vocabulary. <laughs> <laughs> I learned you a know, lot. I, actually, he's a great guy. Yeah, you know, he's 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 you know done a lot of amazing investments and invest, you know put money where he thought it, he saw it fit. You you touched on something that to me is near and dear to my heart as well as Dave, which was the education side of things. And the, and the role it plays, I 100% agree with you that in order for us to achieve greatness, we have to have a society that is not just educated, but I think well-educated. And as I was thinking about uh, something that you uh, wrote in your book uh, on, on why you, you stressed education, I, I, I was reading a passage where you went back to your alma mater, Columbia University, and you had a chance encounter with a student wearing a t-shirt that you say changed your life. Yeah. Why did that t-shirt and what was on it change your life? Yeah, well, like everyone, I thought, you know, once I'm done with school, I'm done. I've, I've finished learning. I've got the diploma hanging on the wall and I don't have to learn anything. Anymore. You know, now I just go do, I don't learn. And, I, and boy, was I wrong. The kid walked across campus and his t-shirt said education is freedom those three words mm. and that's what stopped me in my tracks and it was like wait a minute now you know it it's not about money no no it's not about i got my diploma and i i don't need to learn anymore no the more i learn the more free i'll be 
so I could go learn to fly airplanes and then I'll have that freedom or I could go learn to be an artist and I'll have the freedom to create and I you know my you mean I, I keep on learning and yeah that that was the epiphany that I had it was like wait a minute that's how I got here because the more I learn I figured out the more I could do and why stop here you know I'm a CEO now my learning is just beginning I've got a license to learn as a newly minted CEO, I better use that learning and keep learning in order to continue to succeed. And that's really the essence. That was the message that I took away from that t-shirt. And that's the message that I put in my book that, you know, learning is one of those things and, and it, it, people think they equate it to money. Oh yeah, I got to go to school and I make X number of dollars. It's got nothing to do with that. It's everything about to do with being as free as you want to be throughout the rest of your life. Because the more you learn, the more free you'll ultimately be. Yeah. Um, you know, with your book, Education is Freedom, you mentioned that the American dream, you know, there's passage in there about the American dream. And, you know, um, do you think that the American dream has slipped out of the hands of, you know, the younger generation that are, that are coming up? Is it, is it attainable? And what is your opinion? What do you think the American dream is to the next generation that's coming up right now? Yeah. Well, the, 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 the subtitle of the book, um, in fact, I'm going to reach over and show you because it's so important. It's so relative, relevant to what you just said. The future is in your hands, right? The American dream is not about somebody giving you anything. The American dream started with the idea that as Americans, we control our own destiny. Therefore, our future is in our hands, right? And yeah, there's a lot of excuses. School's expensive. Go back in the dollars that I spent, $7,500 in today's money. Is fifty thousand dollars a year. It's, hmm. it, it's it's it was expensive then. It's expensive now. Um, there's a, a million excuses. Oh, the school system is broken. Well, I don't like what teachers are teaching. You know, there is absolutely zero excuse for anyone failing to take advantage of all the resources that are at our fingertips in this country, especially, and using them to do whatever we want to do, whatever we want to accomplish. So, no. Very simply, I don't think the American dream is under pressure even. I think the American dream is more vibrant than it ever has been. Um, but my message in the book, up to the individual to take advantage of. You know, Jim, I'm going to play a little bit of devil's advocate on that for you, right? I'm just sure. going to take the other side for a moment. Bring because it. there's millions of people um, that, like in your early days as well, your early childhood, they're, they're in dire straits. They, they may not have cardboard walls, but their family can't afford even to pay for food. Um, and so they don't know um, that this, this, this possible road and path exists, um, given that you, you touched on something. And I, and I, I looked up a few numbers uh, uh, in terms of costs. So according to Social Security Administration, that the average or the median income has only gone from uh, 41,186 all the way up to, I'm sorry, I read it backwards. So from 28,000 in 2001 to 41,000, almost 42,000 in 2021. Uh, that's that's a, a small increase when you compare the increase of four-year tuition, which on average has gone up for public school, 167%. Uh, the four year uh, rise in home, or I'm just saying, I just say the rise in home prices has also gone up 184%, you know? So the math is against a lot of folks, like it was for you in those early days as well. What do you say to those people? I say, I say don't let people fool you into believing that the math <clears throat> is impossible. And, you know, again, it, 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 I was making a buck 75 an hour at McDonald's 
Um, and the idea of having to spend $7,500 a year seemed an impossible, impossible task. But yeah, you'd never be able to work that, that payment out at that, at that wage. No, no, exactly. And so what everybody forgets, is, here's the way of looking at it. Your investment in education is like any other investment. If I was to say, I'm going to go buy this business over here and I'm going to spend a million dollars to buy that business. Well, it may take 10 years for that million dollars to generate a return. But I do it knowing that even though there's a trajectory to get that return, that million dollars that I spend today is going to make me a million dollars a year in 10 years. But I make that investment. For some reason, we don't look at education that way. We look at education as well. If I make this, if I spend this money now, I expect I'm going to pay that student loan off in two years, three years, five years. We're forgetting that our salary in five years, 10 years, 20 years is not going to be that 20000 or that 40000 It's likely to be 100000 200000 down the road if we are able to have that education and earn those jobs down the road. It's an investment. It's like any other investment. It's good old capitalism. Yes, college is expensive. So you make the investment today and you reap the benefits and a return on investment over time. Do you think, do you think that uh, in today's age, you know, um, I'm years removed from college myself, as well as you are, and the environment today is so different uh, in terms of options. There's so yeah. many more options for learning, which is what you advocate in your book. Yeah. What's your take on college today? Is that a, still a viable option given the myriad of options available to folks getting ready to get ready for college and have their kids go to school or those contemplating whether they should go to college at all? Yeah, Rolando, I'm gonna, I love that question. I'm going to give you two answers and I apologize for the length, but I want to take it from oh, a go micro, for it. I want to take it from a micro perspective, the individual, and then a macro perspective. Where are we in America and in the world, right? Where do you want to start? Micro or macro? Wherever you feel like doing. All right. Let's start macro. My book is a call to action for corporations because it's 7-Eleven or Blockbuster, I had a hard time hiring people into jobs. Why do you think you see so many first-generation Americans at 7-Eleven stores? Because immigrants are able to come here, be an employee, be a licensee, and take jobs sometimes that our people won't take, but then they work them their way into a store manager or franchisee role and progress through the system. And didn't you work your way up from 7-Eleven as well? I did. And, and not, not from store level at 7-Eleven. My education brought me in a completely different level with, within 7-Eleven. But, but corporations, my point is, corporations have this huge need. Now, we're the, think of that as demand. Okay, I'm going to bring this back to classic business terms, right? The demand for employees is with corporations. We're not now satisfying the demand. We don't have enough employees especially educated employee, employees, to fill the pipeline of all the Fortune 500 companies that are out there, or, or even small businesses. And that's a fact, that we're yeah. in a tight labor market across the board. Massive demand. Now, where's the supply coming from? Schools, right? Public schools, private schools, colleges. Our college enrollments have fallen. We were up in the high or 50% plus range, and they've fallen down now, down into the low 40s percentage of people attending college. Meanwhile, China went from 2012 to 2022 from the low 40s up to close to 60%. Wow. Right? So other countries are investing in highly educated and secondary, post-secondary education. America's sitting around going, ah, just go be a TikTok, you know, guy. Or, you know, <laughs> yeah, why, why not? TikTok. TikTok. Yeah. <laughs> YouTuber. I love it. I'm a TikTok guy now. I'm, I'm doing it too. Let me but throw something before you, before you go 
further. Yeah. So I, I, I yeah. just want to point something out that I, I saw Shark Tank, Kevin O'Leary, and I saw another uh, investor type point out that the high, um, the individuals at the top of their game that are just creating thumbnails are commanding as much as mm. 300K a oh, yeah. year. So if yeah. you're really good at that skill, yeah, we would have, would have thought that, you know, five or 10 years, this is the kind of income you could generate by being at the top of your game in one of those arenas in the, in the creator economy. And, and that's the answer. That's the key. Michael Jordan didn't need to go to college because he's at the top of his game. It doesn't matter what you're doing. If you're a plumber and you're at the top of your game, you're going to be doing fine. And if you're mm -hmm. a TikTok developer and creator and you're at the top of your game, you're going to make more money than you would if you, but, but those are the outliers. What I worry about mm -hmm. is the average person that's relying on, I'm going to be a professional basketball player. Yeah, I'm going to be a happen. TikTok star. It could mm -hmm. happen. It could happen. But bring it back to your probabilities of success. So a macro, I'm going to stay macro for a minute. Where is America in 20, 30, 40 years in our ability to maintain global competitiveness if so many young people forego formal education and they're out, you know, being entrepreneurs and, and, and pursuing vocations and stuff like that? Are we going to end up sourcing? our talent from other countries we're already doing it you look at, remember, and we're behind by the way on that you know the pandemic shut the borders all over the air and yep. sea and everywhere else where we brought in immigrants yeah and basically um steve cadigan who told this a former linkedin uh, hr executive he said basically we're behind a quarter million to three hundred thousand skilled workers we probably yeah. will never catch up now at this rate with yeah. what we need to supply um, companies and, and the rest. But that is creating a false sense of opportunity because we're in a bubble right now where I can, I don't need to go to college. I can go out and make 20, 30, 40 bucks an hour, you know, without any degree. And then I look at the return on that. And I go, this doesn't make any sense, but this is the, this now I'm going to take it macro, micro, we're going to take it back to the individual, right? Gotcha. When I was, I would, I grew up in one of those bubbles and McDonald's was having a hard time hiring, and they tried to talk me into going to McDonald's University. <laughs> yeah, I could have. I could have. Hey, burgers at Wendy's. So I, yeah, I get, I get you. I did that. And it was tempting. I was making a buck seventy-five an hour, and they offered me like five bucks an hour if I went Ooh. to McDonald's U and became a store manager and all that stuff. Um, you know, but and we were in one of those bubbles like we're in now that it was very tempting to take the short-term easy path you know, and make more money now. And again, back to my point, from an individual's perspective, they have to look at it as the investment because that bubble of near-term opportunity where I can make so much money being a TikTok creator or, you know, or just going to work and being a plumber or something, I can make a lot of money right now. But where will you be and how much freedom will you have? In you want to own the plumbing company. You want to set yourself as the entrepreneur that maybe and, has, you know, four or five guys with trucks working for you mm -hmm. uh, and, and setting yourself up in that way so that you don't have to do all the, you know, you use your wrench and get underneath uh, the dirty sinks and cleaning sewer lines and that kind of stuff. Exactly. Exactly right. And then one last piece, because this is such an important thing. We forget that our education ends up being part of our brand. Okay. So I go to a bank and I try to borrow money for a new startup and I've got an undergraduate degree. I've got a master's degree in business. It's going to be easier for me to, run, to raise money from either an outside investors or from a bank versus somebody who doesn't have those undergraduate credentials. Um, Talk about that, you know, because a lot of people face a hard time when they you know, what, what you just saying, you know, you, you hear the Silicon Valley stories that, you know, people are throwing money and then they're swimming in startup cash. And, and part of that is because places like Silicon Valley, places like New York, Austin, um, here in the DC area, there are highly educated people. They're able to, you know, walk into a bank or into a room and talk in the investor language, like you're saying, 
You know, there is a language that investors speak and angel funding folks speak that when you're around, I know I recall my days in liberal arts, I was around people that had means and their language is different. Mm -hmm. And it's just a fact, you know, and what the expectations are, they're different. That's just a fact. And as much progress as we've made on that front as a culture, as a society, there's still some entrenched things that we still have to deal with. And investors want certain things served to them when it comes to a story about a startup. Sure, sure. And, it, you know, it's, again, it's, it, it, what it represents, when you, when you take a can of soda off the wall, um, is it a Coke? Is it a Pepsi? Or is it RC? Or is it <laughs> Poland, right? Yeah. And if I don't know Polar Cola, I said it right, too. If I, <laughs> if I don't know what's in that can, because I'm not familiar with that brand, I may grab the Coke because I know what's in that or the Pepsi. Now, you're an employee or you're an entrepreneur and you're in front of an investor or you're in front of an employer and they're looking at your resume. It's your brand, you know? And to the extent you invest today, in getting that credential, whatever it is, undergraduate degree, graduate degree, that brand is going to be part of what you carry forward in the future. And it just makes it easier for the employer to evaluate you versus somebody else or for the banker to lend you money versus somebody else. It's all part of your brand. And that's, that's, that's the core message that, look, I'm a proponent of education. You can learn anything now from the internet mm -hmm. but in today's world and tomorrow's world there's still going to be a need somehow for us to measure how much you know for the foreseeable future that degree is going to be the most tangible measurement of your uh, ability to have gone through a standard formalized education process and you know uh I think about my four years at, in college, I had a lot of fun. I can't complain. Um, I, I didn't have a lot of money. As I told you, I flipped burgers at Wendy's and um, I did um, a student. Uh, I was a student working uh, on campus and getting paid uh, doing work study. So, you know, I, I, li I lived the, the poor student life for, for, for several years, uh, but I had fun. And I, I remember right before going to college, uh, I went to school in Florida, a high school. And it wasn't a great school. It was a horrible school. One of the worst schools in Florida, actually. One led the dropout rates almost every single year while I was there. And um, people were very down on education. They were like, what do you want to go to school for? Let's have fun. It's Florida. You know, you, you yeah. have fun. You could, I like said. you said, there were, you could work at the UPS distribution center and make way more money than you want. Walt Disney World was down the street. Why do you want to go to college? And it would have been a huge mistake because you learn so much, even outside the classroom, mm -hmm. interacting with people from around the world. I you know I had the opportunity to go to the Ukraine when it had collapsed, which was a story onto itself. But you, you meet so many things and your mind changes. And when you get into that corporate world and you meet somebody from the Ukraine, it, it, oh, I remember stories about the early days. When, and now you build a bond, you build a connection, you understand what it was like in the Crimea before what what happened with, with with russia going in you understand you know where sevastopol is you know what the history is behind the, the crimean wars and you're able to make those connections that otherwise other people would have missed in your professional career because they don't oh ukraine it's over there right i don't even know where it is on a map i know i've heard of it but i don't even know where it is but yeah. you can relate to people in a way when you have all these collective experiences through the years i had the opportunity to play um Football while I was in college too, so that changed also my 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 mindset as well. So uh, I'm a I love the idea of going to college. N the only thing I, I I and you've kind of challenging my thinking right now, which is you know it still has value. And based on what you told me, is that it's still like a stamp of approval in a lot of circles. And without that stamp of approval, you're going to face some real tough challenges. Exactly. You know, and, and look, down the road, we will have a way to measure how much you can learn through technology on a, on a device. I mean, right now, 
And you can learn more math from Khan Academy than you can, you know, in your, in your class. But we don't yet have the tools to measure how successful you were in learning on Khan Academy. So you could be an absolute wizard of math. But is anybody going to hire you based on, you know, your Khan Academy knowledge versus somebody who's got a degree, a master's degree in, in, in math, you know? Um, so for the, that will change, but it probably won't change for another 10, maybe 20 years. And if you're in that no man's land of, well, we're still looking for those credentials, you know, mm. uh, you're going to be in trouble down the road and then forget all the credentialing your point of you get experiences still in the university environment that you won't get on your own. Um, we are a shrinking world because of technology. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I interact now with people all over the world on a regular basis. I'm doing business with people in China and, and, and in London and, and in South America. I could not do that without having had the the cultural literacy really that I gained in a in a university environment mm -hmm. being forced to interact with other people in other cultures. And so <laughs> sometimes for the good, sometimes for the bad. You know, I yeah. had a lot of debates with people in school and I'm sure this happened it, probably across all colleges campuses this happens today. You know, it's still oh, yeah. going on where you know like I, I see this this way, you see it that way and you're wrong and I'm right. And, you know, and eventually you kind of, you know, figure some things out and you're like, oh, maybe I was wrong the whole time. Yeah. Uh, and uh, you kind of mature as we get us a transformative times of your, of your formal years, right? 18 to 20 something while yeah. you're in school. You know, people are freaking out right now. They're looking at what's going on at, at, at Harvard. And, you know, uh, it's funny. <clears throat> I, I'm just old enough so that I remember walking out of school on this thing called Memoriam, Memor uh, what was it? Moratorium Day, right? During the, during the Vietnam War, everybody walked out of school. People were horrified. You know, there were all these protests and, you know, um, people tearing up buildings, doing all the stuff that, you know, is, when it happens today, everybody freaks out and says, oh my gosh, what's wrong with kids today? So I, I remember that. And I remember distinctly having no earthly idea what was going on, but I walked out of school with everybody else because they did it, right? <laughs> it's it's and, the right thing to do. Yeah, I mean, you're a kid and you have no idea. And so today we see kids protesting on campus at Harvard or something like that. And everybody's freaking out and going, oh my God, what's wrong with the kids today? They're just a mess. And the irony is the people that are the biggest critics of all that protesting and kid behavior, they were the hippies in the, in, the, right. in the 1970s who protested the Vietnam War, sat around getting stoned, and their parents thought they were like, you know, a lost generation. Now they're conservatives. You know? right. Everything old is new. Yeah. Right? It, yeah. It patterns. It's like, again, we've seen this movie before. Exactly. And, you know, I want to I wanna just share with you, speaking about, every, you know, movies and things and kids, you remind me of a story you know, especially that, you know, you were, you were at the top of Seven Eleven. Uh, I think you may, you may get a kick out of it and maybe not. Uh, there, I had a friend in high school and like I said, you know, we didn't have much means. So he, one day we, we stopped at Seven Eleven to get stuff is on the way to school. And, and he's like, what do you want? And I'm like, I don't have any money. All I have is gas money. That's all I had like three, four bucks. So I went and pumped the gas and I'll have his gas money. So I pumped the gas. He went in the store. And um, he and comes back out with the, I think it was a big gulp. Whatever the biggest container that was at the store, it was opaque. So you it's couldn't see what up. was inside. And one of the things that he would, and he was an offensive lineman. You know, he was 6'4", 300 plus pounds. And uh, he, he comes back full. And, I, and I'm like, what took you so long? He's like, I had to get a few things. I'm like, what? Is, what you only have a big gulp. I think it was a big gulp, right? So is that the largest thing that you can have? wasn't yeah. a slurpee so he filled it up and then he takes out a snickers bar he takes out a, the twinkies and i'm like you put that all in there I'm, he's like <laughs> yeah that, he's like that's how that's how i get my treats when i go back to school and I, because he also had no means um, yeah. he was he was actually sleeping on the couch of 
our football coach, head coach at that time. So that's how bad things were for us at that time. Yeah. And I thought, hmm, that's not so bad. Give me one of those. And, uh, but that's at one point I said to him, you know, uh, I almost said his name. I don't want to say his name to embarrass him. Uh, I said, you know, we, we can't do this anymore. Somebody's going to catch it. He's like, ah, they're just teenagers behind the counter. They don't even care. And I'm six foot four, 300 plus pounds. <laughs> he doesn't attract attention. He's, he's a little guy like me. <laughs> so, so I, I actually, I've, I've heard that story and yeah. <laughs> I literally used to get from time to time, somebody would send me a note and they'd put a little check in it for like $2 and 75 cents. <laughs> <laughs> And they'd say, dear Mr. Keys, I'm so sorry. It's been bothering me for years, but I stole a candy bar in your store <laughs> years ago. <laughs> and and I, it's been weighing on me ever since. <laughs> Here's the money with interest. <laughs> so you can redeem yourself. You can send. He can, I, I will tell him. I'll tell him to send you the, because it'd probably be a lot. He can afford it now. He's, he's doing better. He went to NC State, played football there. He eventually got, um, he, he worked his way up at one of the NFL teams. Uh, and so he, he's uh, on the back office side, so he's done well. But I just thought I, you know, so you've heard that story before. Oh, yeah. um, and, I want, and I wanted to end it on a little bit of a light note. So I know that your time is precious. So I want to do, Ori, are you ready for rapid fire? So we could wrap it up with James, with Jim on the rapid fire. Hit me up with the rapid fire segment. Let's go. All right. So whatever hits your brain when I say this phrase or, or these words, it's, it's all we want to hear. And uh, Dave and I will take turns here on this rapid fire segment. The first one you started touching on a little bit, but I want you to tell me, what do you think about Walmart versus Amazon? Amazon. Amazon. Love Walmart, but uh, I think Amazon, advantage Amazon right now. But don't, don't, don't count out Walmart. Okay. No, we certainly won't. Now, you mentioned TikTok, that you've, you've started participating on TikTok, but what is your favorite social media platform? Uh, probably at the moment, Instagram, but it changes. Mm. Okay. Yeah, Instagram, I'm getting more a little more traction than TikTok. Interesting, interesting. Um, and if you're listening, Gary V or Team Gary V, you've got a guy right here who could use your services. He he knows a thing or two about all that all that stuff. Favorite piece of tech. Favorite piece of tech changes all the time. Um, favorite piece of tech. At the moment, um, it's kind of boring, but it is my iPad because I'm using it now for virtually everything. I've thrown away the PC and I'm using a Mac only because of the, for podcasts, the quality is better. But I, I use that, um, the iPad Pro for about everything. Okay. And it, it travels easy. That's for sure. Yes. Uh, all right. First thing you do in the morning after you turn your alarm off. What's the first thing you reach for in the morning after you turn your alarm off? Excuse me. Uh, vitamins. Little routine. Right. Get out of bed. Go straight to the vitamin thing. Pop a couple of vitamin D's. Okay. Interesting. Vitamins. I'm not... Uh... You don't I want do to know that. what I do after that, but <laughs> <laughs> it's not in my script, so I won't ask. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I say no, scratch you... my butt after I get out of bed. <laughs> <laughs> Some, something to do with that. Yeah. Um, you mentioned an iPad. Is there a podcast that's your favorite thing right now or you're nerding out on right now? Um yes. Uh I have, um, there's a group called the School of Hard Knocks, mm -hmm. um, and uh, those guys got me, um, I think I'm 
pushing 15, 16 million views. Um, wow. Yeah. On a little interview that we did together. Um, that was pretty, uh, pretty amazing that we, they were able to accomplish that. Nice. I nice. saw that School interview. Hard knocks. Let's I give saw that interview. That. Um, I saw the crew. Uh, very impressed with the, the whole. The whole interview was great. Um, their layout, their platform. Yeah, I like that. School of hard knocks. Give them a sure. thumbs up. Uh, and here's the last question we have. Other than education is freedom, what's a game changing book that you would recommend? So many. <laughs> other than education is freedom <laughs> um one that was given to me that's pretty pretty powerful from a business perspective is something called the daily drucker and um i had an opportunity to visit with peter drucker just before he passed mm-hmm. and he put in um described his book gave it to me it was basically a compilation of everything that he had taught over his entire career and it's like one a day, little gems of business knowledge, one a day. So um, that's just one that pops into my head. I could give you a hundred others, but oh, if you have others, that's your favorite one. But if there's other ones you think are equally worthy, oh, there we go. And, and oh, Ori's that. highlighting this. If you're watching this on on the video or listening to audio, you want to see it. It's on Amazon. It's called The Daily Drucker: 366 Days of Insight and Motivation for Getting the Right Things Done. Yeah, it's pretty, wow. pretty powerful business learning. So, I mean, one of the things that Drucker said that I, you know, I, I love is the um, difference between leader, between um, management and leadership. And a, a manager does, um, does things right, right? Work on trying to do right things. Mm-hmm. A leader does the right thing. And it's a big difference between doing things right and doing the right thing. Very. That's classic, classic truck. Oh, the juxtaposition. Juxtaposition, yeah. Wow. Um, I, I love it. That's a great book. Did you have another one? You said oh, you one, one just, another one that just popped into my head, Simon Sinek and why, uh, you know, book about why. And uh, it, it, it came to mind because as I was writing Education is Freedom, I was focused on the what and the how of education and learning. You know, uh, we talked about some of those. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, and, uh, you know, I was halfway through the book and, and focused on what to learn, which was things like, you know, embracing change, having confidence, having clarity. Those were the what to learn things. And then the how to learn what, you know, things like, um, you know, critical thinking, which is, often missing from our our discourse today and uh uh collab uh, and critical thinking uh curiosity you know the ability to just i walk around i'm curious about everything that's what drives my learning and creativity i'm i'm part-time artist i write music i paint pictures and but i do it on purpose because it makes me learn and 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 it, and it carries over into the learning process that creative process uh, Einstein called it intelligence having fun. It's creativity. So I, I, here I'm wrapped around the axle. I'm working on all those things. I'm building them all into, into the book. I have a chapter on each. And then I somebody brought Senex's book to the to my attention and said, but but why? You know, I was like, well, of course, because why? Because of course. <laughs> and and I realized I hadn't answered why. Why learn? Mm. Why go to school? Why are these things? You hit you you hit it, Rolando, when you said my experience in college, I, I had to interact with all these other people. And I mean, you hit on the why. And so I baked into my book addressing the why of education and learning. And I, I characterize it as three things. Uh, one is uh, collaboration, because we're not in this world alone. If it and the power of many coming together works you learn that in in a business environment you just can't do it most entrepreneurs fail because they're afraid to let go right Mm -hmm. they don't effectively collaborate the second c is the c the the key to collaboration is cultural literacy and and it's you know we get all wound around the axle with diversity and dei and all that stuff today right and everybody's fighting about it 
-hmm. cut through all that stuff. What's really important about diversity is learning from other people who aren't like you. True. Indeed. They have different experiences, different cultures, different, you know. So cultural literacy is a critical part of why to learn, why to go to school even, because you get exposure. And then, uh, and then finally, the last and most important piece of the why is character, because, you know, there's no class on character, on things like integrity, humility, gratitude, um, compassion. There's no class on any of that stuff, um, but it's a critical element that you learn through the experience of being with other people and going through an education process. You build your brand, your character, and other people see you in that fashion. And so that's a, all of that's part of the why of education that I talk about in the book. And I, you know, and I thank Simon Sinek in his book uh, for reminding me that, you know, that why is an important missing piece of virtually everything we do. Well said. I, awesome. Uh, that is just terrific. Give it a clap up. It's just an amazing thing. Uh, Jim, I've had an awesome time talking to you uh, both today and our, on our during our pre-chat. Uh, I've, I've learned already a lot. Um, continuously uh, learning. A guest that we had from BlackBerry almost said the same thing about curiosity. And it seems like great minds think alike. Uh, it's, I know it sounds cliche, but he, he, he really hit that on the curiosity, opening up a whole world of things. Uh, and you, you've said almost the exact same thing. So um, I hope that people today uh, that have been listening and, or watching us today have gotten something out of this. And if you want to support Jim and his book, uh, go ahead and check it out. It's available on Amazon. It is called Education is Freedom. Is that right, Jim? There it is. Education is Education Freedom. Is freedom. And so you'll get a you'll get a lot out of it. There's a lot of knowledge and and a lot of sh uh, experiences that you you know condense into this book. Uh, and I'm sure that there may be version number two coming out after this because it sounds like you got a lot more on your in your mind and your heart that you want to share at some point as well. Oh yeah, uh, I do, I do. I, I'm, I'm, I, I, I've got the the book bug now. I've, I've uh, I want to go do this again. So. <laughs> And I want to thank you. Yeah, no, and I, and I want to thank you for for sharing your life experiences with us today. Uh, I'm I'm very appreciative, and I really was looking forward to our conversation today. And I'm sure our audience has gotten a lot out of that. Uh, and again, go ahead and support um, Jim and his book. Uh, we'll put links to it as well uh, in the description below. And if you want to support the channel as well, we'll have some links to other things that you can support if you want to support this channel. And if you want to learn more about business, how to avoid big time mistakes, check out the interview I did with James Orsini from the Vayner Media Group. You've got something there that he's got a lot to share. He's also a wealth of knowledge, works with Gary Vaynerchuk, uh, and he just started, uh, I want to say he's now president of startup operations over there. Uh, Dave, wasn't that right? Didn't he say? He yeah, was I think just... I think that was officially announced. Yes, it's been official, so we can say that. So, James, congratulations to you, James Orsini. <laughs> I got two James. James Orsini, congratulations to you on that new. Um, I, I guess I would imagine it's a promotion of sorts, uh, being uh, head of startup operations over at Vayner Media. So, congratulations. So, Jim, thank you again for coming on today. It's been a pleasure. And, I'm, and we'll see you the next time. Now, for those on YouTube, right up here, I've got a video somewhere up in here where Dave and I talk a little bit more on how to accelerate your business. And check out those episodes. Dave and I will see you in those episodes.